Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Hey, welcome. Glad that you are here at FaithBridge today. And I hope that you're going to get in a grow group this January. We'll have one of those meet and greets coming up in several weeks. So welcome today, whether you're in Center Core West, Center Core East, whether you're online watching live, and that includes even the church over in South Korea that we just learned about, and the 35 of you who are with us every week. And so that's awesome. So welcome. Take your Bible, and we're going to go to, yeah, praise the Lord. So we're going to go to Luke uh, today, and you're going to be turning there. Chapter 10 is where we're going in just a few moments. Um, if you need a Bible, just flag down one of the ushers. They'll be glad to let you have one. So while you're kind of getting there to Luke 10, let me uh, tell you about a problem that I think we have. You and I uh, all have this problem. It goes like this. Many of us sort of drag ourselves out of bed every morning and start in on the day's routine, hoping against hope that we can just hold our ground. You know, maybe the house won't turn into a disaster and it can actually stay kind of clean. Maybe we'll kind of break even on the list of things to do. Nobody could get sick. Maybe we'll just not even have to go to the doctors today. Maybe the inbox won't get any fuller. Maybe if those things all go well, we could also get our oil changed because we need to do, do that for about three weeks or we could get the exterminator out and we're way behind schedule on that. We could get all the Christmas thank you notes written and it's kind of getting a little late for that. Or we get started on the taxes because that's going to be coming up here pretty soon. And <clears throat> if we can get all those sorts of things, maybe we could even pitch in and help our spouse a little bit with all the stuff that they're carrying with their load, right? Maybe we say to ourselves, We could just beat back the beast of busyness one more day to live to tell another, okay? And, and, and so that's, I think the, you know, a lot of what goes on in many of our lives day after day, week after week. In his book, Crazy Busy, uh, Kevin DeYoung talks about this problem and about how overwhelmed it makes so many people feel these days, which is not good for the soul, and which adds, you know, this, especially those of us who love Jesus, and maybe you're a church person, and you love Jesus in the Bible, and you're like, I should be feeling joyful. I don't feel joyful. I feel resentful, you know, and, and, and then we end up, you know, fighting with the people that we love most, like our spouse, or our children, or pounding our wheel at the traffic. Anything can serve as the proverbial straw that might just break the camel's back when we're always living that maxed out uh, sense of, uh, of life. It's a cycle that we get into. And usually when you're in the depth of the cycle, you swear we're going to change something around here. When, once I get through this, we're going to change it. And you do get through it. But then a week goes by and two weeks go by and it feels kind of normal again. And, and you kind of forget that resolve that you had to change it until maybe three or four weeks later and there's another deadline and you start back in and you're doing it again, again, again. Gordon MacDonald in his book, Ordering Your Private World, tells the story of a nightmare that really happened to people who woke up in a Florida apartment and saw the ground sinking before their very eye. The streets falling in, cars going in, the the building was going to be the next thing to go in to this Florida sinkhole. He explains that a sinkhole uh, occurs, let me make sure I, I, I get this right, a sinkhole occurs when the underground streams drain away during the drought. So the foundation's lost and everything sinks in. He goes on to explain, that is a good physical picture of what's going on in a lot of our spiritual lives. A lot of our lives are lived on the surface. This is, this is the, the, the stuff that you think about instinctively. The, uh, you know, the, the assets that have to be accumulated, 
the degrees that have to be earned, the credentials, the relationships, the connections, the jobs that have to be finished, the relationships that have to uh, be worked on, the physical fitness that we want to keep and outer beauty. and All of these things, he points out, are surface things. And they're easy for us to put our focus on because they're visible. They don't go away. You just see them every day. The problem, he says, is that many of us have a sinkhole deep within that we're always on the edge of crumbling into. And it has to do with our soul. Because we're spending all our time asking things on the surface rather than asking the question, how's the state of my soul? How's my soul doing on the inside? Now, I realize the, the temptation for any of us is to say, well, you know, I don't have time to get to, 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 to my soul because I've got all these other things going on. I've got to put all my energy there. Don't, don't fall for the, for the uh, trap. Fall into that trap. Because, because see, here's, here's what's, <laughs> what's happening in so many lives. We look the wrong direction from where the solution would really come. I, I, I'll, uh, I'll illustrate with myself. About 10 years ago, I remember I was having some, some back pain, lower back pain, and it just kind of kept hurting, and, and finally I was talking with an expert and said, okay, so now what, what do I need to do? Because I'm, should I be putting ice on it? Should I be putting the heating pad on it? Should I put Ben Gay on it? I just don't know what to do, and I'm tired. Of, and he said, yeah, 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 yeah. So the problem is you're looking in the wrong direction for your solution. If we're going to fix your back, we've got to focus on your front. I said, no, no, my front feels fine. He said, no, 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 this is the problem. See, and he explained to me what I'd never heard about, and that's your core. And you know what your core is. Your core is kind of the power center. That's where everything's, that's where your balance is going to come from. He said, that's, that, and he said, that's your foundation. Actually, if we could get your core looking a little bit more like a six-pack and a little less like a donut, then your back problems are going to go away because you'll be strong in your core. I think that's a good picture uh, for us because in a spiritual sense, we, if you're feeling overwhelmed, if you're feeling crazy busy, if you say, I got to have some breathing room, I bet it's because you're looking at superficial things and you run out and you buy another book on how can I manage my time a little bit better and, and how can I say no a little bit more and you probably ought to manage your time a little bit better and you probably ought to say no a little bit more and those are good sorts of things, but, but, but you're looking the wrong direction. That's topical solutions. The real problem has to do with your soul. That's the core of the issue, and that's what we've got to deal with. All right, so <clears throat> let me give you a quote, and then we're going to go to the passage. C.S. Lewis pointed out, talking about this soul stuff, you're not mostly a body with a soul in there somewhere. You're mostly a soul. And for a few years here on earth, you have a body. So you need to be spending time developing the part of you that's going to last forever throughout eternity. Let's look at this passage in Luke chapter 10, okay? Many of you know the story. Some of you don't know the story. I'll give you a little background in case you don't know the story. So there's this little community called Bethany that was kind of like a suburb of Jerusalem, and whenever Jesus and his disciples were passing that way, they particularly enjoyed staying with his dear friends, uh, Martha, Mary, and Lazarus, two sisters and a brother. Because they always felt this hospitality and just felt very homey. And, and so you, you get the sense that, that there was just a real nice, sort of a home away from home whenever he was passing near Bethany. Okay, that's the context of, of where what we're going to uh, read happened. Now, in verse 38 of chapter 10, in Luke. As Jesus and his disciples were on their way, he came to a village where a woman named Martha opened her home up to him. She had a sister called Mary who sat at the Lord's feet listening to what he said. But Martha was distracted by all the preparations that had to be made. Martha came to him and asked, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to do the work by myself? Tell her to help me. Martha, Martha, the Lord answered. You're worried and upset about many things, but few things are needed. Indeed, only one. Mary 
has chosen what is better, and it will not be taken away from her. And let's talk about this for a few minutes, okay? Now, we know that Martha, she was the more type A driven, sort of meticulous. One theologian says maybe her last name could have been Stuart. And, and so she was always trying to make the home just look great and be a, a great person of hospitality. But on this occasion where, where they're entertaining Jesus, <clears throat> she, she gets irked by the fact that her sister Mary is just sitting at the feet of Jesus, listening to him tell the stories, and she's just locked in. And finally, she's had enough. She goes in and says, hey, why am I the only one here in the kitchen? Why am I the one that's getting everything ready? She's just sitting there. Tell her, Lord, get up and come help me. That's the whole story. I think the key word, if you're looking for one key in the passage, you would circle the word that I paused after, distracted. Because it's not that, that Martha was doing anything bad. She was doing good things. She just wasn't doing the best thing. I like how Gene Peterson translated it in the message. Martha, dear Martha, you're fussing far too much and getting yourself worked up over nothing. And we do that, don't we? We go through our days, our months, our years feeling upset, feeling anxious, troubled, fussing, worked up. Every stain, every school project, every dirty sink, every blade of grass, every surprise gift, guest, All these sorts of things can just about bring everything into the sinkhole of our soul if we don't maintain the soul. We can get so absorbed in the surface things of life. It's no wonder that our shrinking, shriveled souls can't support what's going on up there. So what do we do? Here again, (laughs) We don't run out and buy another book on how do I time manage better. Although that won't hurt you. It's just not going to fix you at the deepest level. Okay? We've got to figure out how to learn from what Mary knew and from what Martha was learning. And incidentally, don't you know that Jesus was probably thinking when Martha was saying, Tell her to get up and come help me in the kitchen. Don't, don't you know that Jesus was thinking, Martha, oh my gosh, just the other day, I fed 5,000 people, okay? I know how to do food, you know? <laughs> and a while back before that, I made some great Chardonnay at a, at a wedding. I know how to do drink, okay? It's not food and drink that I came here for, Martha. I came here for connection, for fellowship, for relationship. And that's what he says to you, and that's what he says to me as well. But it's strange, isn't it, how we, we relegate the God stuff of life into just a little bit of a compartment, you know, where we, we just say, well, I've got a little crack here, and I've got a little crack here, and God, maybe you can just sort of ooze in and fill those cracks of my life. Rather than saying, no, you're the one I need to start with. You've got to be the foundation to this whole thing called my life. I've got to set you in the proper place, first of all. Let me ask you something. If somebody recorded your life, okay, and then after observing you for a week or two, uh, came back and said to a group of strangers, I've been studying this person's life, and I've concluded I know what the better portion is for him or for her. I know what is most important. What would they say it is of you? If you had somebody secretly just sort of observing you, yard work, housework, office work, posting on Facebook, Instagram, shopping, watching TV, I know these are things that all of us do, and, and all of us have to do things. I got plenty to do my, my, myself. But out of all the concerns in our lives, can any of us say, I've learned what the better thing is? That's where we've got to get. We've got to move the best thing to the top of the list. So if you're kind of saying, okay, 
so kind of give it to me. Where are we going in this message? I want to give you what I'm borrowing again from Kevin DeYoung in his book, Crazy Busy. Um, here, here's, here's a one-point plan to help restore some order in your life and to provide you some breathing room, okay? The best one-point plan I can give you. Devote yourself to the word of God and to prayer, talking with him. That's it. Let's bow for closing prayer. All right, now that, let's, let's keep going just a, a little bit longer, okay? So now, what does this mean? What this means is that, sure, I want you to be here and worshiping on Sundays, and, and that's a great start, but I gotta get you to where you're worshiping him every day in your own quiet place, where you're learning how to, to tend your own soul every day, not just coming here depending on us to kind of help you get it there. That's the key to this. Sometimes people uh, say, well, how long should it be? I'm not even going to say that. Some people start with five minutes. Some people start with 15. Some people start with 30. There's not a right or a wrong uh, to that. But I will say this, a few unhurried minutes are better than a distracted hour. And a consistent habit is better than sporadic bursts and uh, fits of bursts and starts. Okay? Now, as somebody who has sought to maintain a devotional life since I was in high school and struggled with it, had my highs and lows uh, with it, I can tell you that nothing restores the breathing room, the sanity, the equilibrium to life like setting that in its proper place every day. Mary had it right. Now, let me anticipate what some of you are um, thinking right now, okay? Some of you are, especially if you're a Martha personality, you're sort of a type A, get her done, driven kind of person, that personality. You're, you're sitting there and you're picturing yourself trying to sit still, cross-legged on the floor, hour after hour, and you're starting to get nervous because you think, well, and then what if my employees all start sitting there and they start trying to listen to the Lord? And they, uh, Oh, my gosh, the world's going to go crazy because nothing's going to get done. Okay, relax, relax. Let's, let's, let, that's, that's not what we're talking about here. Others of you, you're feeling guilty. And, and the, way, the reason you're feeling guilty is you're like, I know that I know that I know that I know that this is what I need in my life. It's, it, it's sort of like exercise. I have seasons and I've been doing it and then I'm not doing it. I know this is, the, and I feel guilty. And, and is that what you want? No, I don't want you to feel guilty. Okay, um, stay with me here. I'm well aware that the uh, pursuit of personal devotions is just laden with mixed emotions. So let's, let's back up and start here. Spiritual growth requires that our life with God move from the should category to the want to category. And that's the first thing that we're going to have uh, to, to do is sort of move it from the should category to the want to category. John Ortberg describes this well. The nub of the problem is uh, in this sort of message that I'm giving today is that people walk away saying, okay, 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 okay. I know I ought to do that if I was gonna be a good Christian and love Jesus and you know, I'd build this into my life and I know I ought to, ought to, ought to. Ortberg points out, there's two ways that you can uh, interpret the word ought. There's the ought of duty. And, and so that's, that's the ought, like you ought to pay your taxes or you ought to keep your dog on a leash. Okay. But then there's the ought of beauty, of life. There's the ought of opportunity. You ought to taste this cake. You know? You ought to come see this sunset over the mountains. That's not an ought of duty. That's an ought of opportunity. And I think it'll help a lot if we're thinking in terms of our our relationship with the Lord, moving from the side of the ledger that's the ought of duty to the ought of opportunity. Because just think of it. I mean, the very king of the universe 
the creator of our lives, of this world, of the whole galaxy. The, the, the very God of very gods says, I want to have a relationship. And he became personal and came to this earth, not staying aloof from us, but saying, no, no, I love you so much. I want to show you I want to become personal. Comes, lives the life of perfection we couldn't live, dies the death of consequence that, that we deserve to die and rose victorious over the grave, not just to do a a transaction for us of forgiveness where we can have a substitute for our sins. It's not that he's saying, yeah, so I want you to just take part of that transaction, although he certainly does. That we call justification and trusting in faith and Jesus and all. That's, that's he says, yeah, sure to that, but but most of all, I wanna be in a relationship with you. That's why I, it's because I love you. So why are you so busy that you can't meet with the very God of the universe, the very savior of our souls? So again, people ask, okay, so how much time should I do it? And and especially if you're in the ought to side of the ledger that's sort of the ought of duty, they'll ask, you know, how many minutes can I read God's word? Like how how few minutes can I read and he won't be mad at me, okay? It's like, no, 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 no. Here's the deal. If you read the Bible four hours a day, he's not gonna love you any more than he already loves you. You're not doing this for his love for you. He already loves you as much as he'll ever love you. You're doing it for your soul (laughs) to, to fan the flames of your love for him. And when we do that, our lives begin to come into a right sense of calibration. Things begin to fall in place appropriately. We get to sort of jump in the river, in the stream of the flow of what he's doing. And you'll find what you had to get done that day does get done. I'll tell you, there's, there's three things that I've, I, I was thinking about this this past week. There's three things that we preach about periodically. Try to hit them all about once a year, every 18 months. Three things. Sabbath, personal devotions, and tithing. And so I, I was just thinking about, you know, it's interesting. It happens every single time we ever touch on one of these subjects. People uh, sometimes people sit out there and they say, you know, it sounds good. It just, but I'm a bottom line kind of person. It just, the, I can't make the numbers work. It won't, it, it just, it'll never work. Other people go away and say, I'm going to try this Sabbath thing. I'm going to try actually not working one day of the week and just see if maybe God knew what he was talking about. You know, I'm going to try giving at least 10% of what we have back to the Lord, giving it back to God, and just see if he does um, bring our family into um, better order, especially our finances. And cons- same with devotions. Whenever I've touched on this, and it's been actually a few years since we've touched on this, so I'm a little behind schedule, but, but whenever I've talked about this, people come back, give it a month, Two months, people come out and say, you know, I've been trying this thing. I've been trying tithing. I've been trying, actually, I've taken the last, you know, six weeks, I took a Sabbath day. How's it working? They'll say, it's, it's kind of amazing, you know? How so? Well, actually, my wife and I, we've, we have fought less about money ever since we started tithing our whole marriage. And we still have enough, and it's it's like it's it's working. Imagine that, you know. Or somebody says, I, I've, "I've taken a Sabbath these these past six weeks." And how's that work? It's actually working great. I have more time with my family. I'm still getting all the work done that I got to get the work done. And it, but it's it's like I can't exactly explain how it. I know that's how it is with God. Sometimes you just have to step out and say, I'm going to do what he's called me to do. And I'm just going to see if he'll put the pieces of the puzzle of my life in place after I've done by faith what he's calling me to do. Always happens with devotions. And so my challenge today is going to be that you would, that you would say, I'm going to, I, I've got to build this into my life. Or I've got to build it in again. 
Because again, a lot of you, you're, you're not hearing anything that you haven't heard before. You're like, ah, this is good. I need to hear it because I do know this and I need to get back to this. Okay. Let me give you this uh, uh, thought that I found interesting. If you're married, this will be particularly helpful. Even if you're not married, even if you just ever had maybe a, a, a high school crush or a junior high crush, okay? Think back to sort of those feelings that you had when you first heard she likes you or he likes you, okay? And, and, and when that happens, um, what, what, what goes on? You, you can't think. It's just like, what? You're thinking, and she loves me. I can't believe it, you know. And and you lie in bed thinking, she loves me, or he loves me, and and our minds just can't. It's just almost incomprehensible. We're so excited, and it's just like this is all great, oh, you know. And and so and we're just going through. But but here's what happens after ten years, twenty years, thirty years of marriage. Your brain is able to think about other things than the fact. She loves me. You can, you can actually get a lot more thoughts processed. And, 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 and You know why this is? Because there's actually some neurology to this. Your neurons respond to whatever is new. Okay? So whatever ceases to be new ceases to cause the neurons to fire. So the neurons are firing when, when, when you're first falling in love. But over time, the, 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 the pathway for those neurons has it, it's, it's grown familiar. And so that's why when a couple goes in to get a little marital checkup, many times a, a, a marriage counselor, the first thing they might ask is, okay, so when's the last time you two like, had a getaway for a night, maybe two, not with the kids, um, n- not with your briefcase, just, just you two, um, you know. Or if, if you can't get away for a night, when's the last time you had a date night? Like three or four hours, you know, not with the kids, not with your briefcase, just with each other. Just because what happens? What happens when we're with that person that we love is the neurons begin to fire again. And she'll say something or we'll do something. And we laugh and we're like, <laughs> and there's a newness. It was like, and now I remember why I love you so much. It's back. No, no, no. It's, but, but that's exactly what's going on. And so the, the neurons, there, there's, there's something new going on. This, so there, there is even a neurological reason to why the Lord is saying, I want you to come back to me every day. Psalm 1 says, blessed are those who delight in the law of the Lord and meditate on it day and night. They're like a tree planted by streams of water, which yield its fruit in season and whose leaf doesn't ever wither. Whatever they do prospers. The psalmist is saying, hey, there's actually a way that you can carry the thoughts of God's love and his presence and his protection in, in, our, in, in our brains Every sing- that, 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 they're, that they're flowing in our system in such a way that the, the, the neurons are, are firing again and that's giving sustenance to our lives. Somehow through the miracle of God's grace and the economy of his time schedule, then he just consistently resupplies in your productivity, in your organization, your ability for the, for the time that you spent relating to him. But you have to go to him first. You can't say fill in the crack. I've got this, you know, little crack over here. Do your thing, God. No, no, no. One thing is needful. This is the better portion. Martha, learn from your sister, Mary. She's got it right. Proverbs 18.10 says, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, and the righteous man runs into it and is safe. I was thinking of this verse even just over the holiday uh, during some of those cold, rainy days that we had after Christmas. Um, I have two boys, seven and ten, and so some of their friends were over, and since it's rainy and cold, they couldn't really play outside much, and, and so they were doing a lot of hide-and-seek, 
uh, throughout the house. And w- one afternoon in particular, I was sitting in my chair where I like to sit and read, and Suzanne was over in her chair, and she's reading. And, and I heard the kids back in the back, and they're saying, okay, and here's the rules. Da, 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 and you can't go there, and da, da, and you can't lock doors. And, it's, and so then the person who's it starts counting, and, and people start running around the house. And, and I remember one of the little children um, went into this certain closet in our house. And if my ears did not deceive me, I heard this little of the door lob, door knock, uh, uh, lock uh, happening. And I found myself chuckling because, because I was thinking, you know, you're in there and you feel particularly safe because you've got a good hiding place. It's a good closet. But just for extra reinforcement, you've, you've locked, you broke the rules. But I'm sure there's some sort of exception clause in the rule book from what I just heard you all announcing back there. <clears throat> I was thinking about that because I was thinking about this proverb and, and, and thinking that's what the Lord's saying. Hey, I'm a strong tower. Run into me. Lock the door where you'll be safe. He invites us to do that every single day. But the question is, Will you do it? Will you show up? So remember uh, what I said at the beginning. You and I are not human beings just having a temporary spiritual experience here on earth. We're spiritual beings who are just having a temporary earthly experience. Right? And even though we know this, 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 It's so easy for us to get focused on the here and now, right? On today, on tomorrow, on next week. And we forget the very fact that the Lord, who is our Lord today, will still be our Lord 10,000 years from now. What if everything in your schedule, what if everything in my schedule, were actually secondary at best at most secondary because that's what he's saying it is every i don't care how important you are and you're all very important everything in your schedule is secondary one thing one thing is needed So will you choose him? Last thought. Some of you are saying, especially if you've never tried this before. You're saying, okay, I, I want to try this. So, like, how do I do it? Yeah, I mean, put the cookies down here on the shelf where I can get them you know, tomorrow. Um, and how, how do I, like, do this? Okay, so let's talk about that just a few. That's the fun thing about the devotional life is that it can, it can have all sorts of different looks and, and sort of flavors to it. And, and it'll have a lot to do with your personality. And Some people just really connect to the Lord as they're journaling, uh, some through music, some through nature. In fact, Gary Thomas, our friend Gary Thomas, has written a really good book uh, called Sacred Pathways, in which he outlines, I think it's about eight or nine um, pathways that seem to characterize most people's personalities of how they connect best in their devotional life with the Lord. And, and so I would encourage you, if, you, if you're a reader, to, to pick that up and, 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 and give that a read through. Um, let me give you just a, f- a, f- a few practical thoughts. If you were here when Ben Stewart was doing his December series, you might remember uh, one day he gave us a glimpse into his devotional life when he was saying, you know, I t- I s- I've always heard people sit down and talk about you need to have a devotion, and, and I never could do that because I had all these thoughts. And so finally I realized what I had to do before I can be devoted is I got to sit down with a piece of paper and a pen and I got to start writing out everything that's on my mind and just, ah! Because there's all these things that are bothering me. And, and he says, I just got to do it like the old psalmist did it, unfiltered. You remember that? Keep that in mind. 
That might be an important part of your devotional rhythm as well, just sort of to clear the table before you can even hear from God. um, If you've been here for a while, because it's been years since I've talked about the the method that I enjoy using, that acrostic S-O-A-P, that's part of my devotional life, and it it just kind of fits my need for structure and, and just helps me to really connect in Um, with the Lord. I don't have time to explain all of that, but maybe we'll talk about it in the postscript. You can watch the postscript or go online, faithbridge.org slash soap, I think, um, and you can find some resources there. Um, So there's there's any number of ways to do it. You say, okay, so like, really, what am I going to do tomorrow? I've never done this before. How am I going to do it? Okay, uh, let me just, I'll just put it right down here for you. Why don't you do this? Go pick up a spiral notebook at the grocery store on your way home. Get your Bible Go to the book of John, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. It's the fourth book in the New Testament, not the Old Testament. And say, for the next 21 days, I'm going to read a chapter of John. Because there's 21 chapters in John. Okay, So in three weeks, you'll you'll go right through it. So you, and if you're not a a handwriting, maybe you're a, a laptop kind of person, that's kind of how I am. Open up a file on Evernote and just call it My Devotions, and you can just add to it every single day. And <clears throat> so then you do some reading, and then you just sit and you just listen, and you just say, Now, God, what is it that you want to say to me and my life through your word? There's got to be something in there that you want me to take today, to ponder, to ruminate on to apply, and you'll be amazed at how often something the Lord says to you, like, oh my gosh, that's so relevant to this meeting that I'm going to have today or this conversation. That's really helpful. Imagine that. So I'm going to give you the challenge. I want you to do this. Don't just listen to this uh, message and go out and say, well, okay, that was good. I'll get around to that. No, no, no. Let's prioritize. <laughs> we can't grow in our walk with the Lord if we don't prioritize growing in our walk with the Lord, okay? It does, it's just not going to happen um, any other way. Hudson Taylor says, don't have your concert first and then tune the instruments afterwards. Begin with God. So my challenge to you today is try it. Talk about it this week in your grow groups. Many of you are in, in grow groups and talk about it, process, how are you doing, how are you doing, what are you learning, um, and, and what works in your own rhythm of your life. See if he doesn't res- resupply in the minutes and in the productivity what you invested. See if Jesus maybe had something right when he said, Martha, You've got it wrong. Mary has chosen the best thing. One thing. She's got the better portion. And that's what he wants for you and me. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the, um, the reality that um, you want to have a relationship with you, us. You, you want us to connect with you not just transactionally, not just sort of as we're doing business with the, with the banker, um, but you, you really want to be our Lord, be our Savior, be our friend, walking with us through our days this side of heaven. Thanks that it doesn't have to wait to start till we get to heaven, but actually that it, it's in the now that you invited us. No, I want to cultivate your soul now, and I want to use what's going on in your life now to develop you and to grow you in your character and to grow you in your trust. Forgive us, God, for so often sidelining you or putting you on the periphery or just saying, well, if you can find a crack to, to sort of drizzle in, God, then you just sort of slip in there. Uh, but I'm very busy. Forgive us, God for even thinking that way about the very God of the universe and the Savior of our souls. My prayer, Lord, is that even as we go further into this uh, new year, that you would give us grace to move from the 
side of the ledger that's the duty ought to, to the side of the ledger that's the, um, the beauty, the opportunity of being connected with you through your word and through prayer. I pray that you would meet with us, even in our own personal lives, even in the coming week. And I just ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. I'm Luann Riley, Grow Group Director, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just brought the first installment of a new series called Breathing Room. Today we talked about developing your core, and we're going to do a special edition of Postscript today, and Pastor Ken's going to break down for us the method of Bible study that you talked about during the sure. uh, message today, SOAP. First of all, what does SOAP stand for? Well, it's four words. So the first one is scripture, then observation, then application, then prayer. Okay, and how did you, how long, have you been using this message for a, method for a long time, a long time. from what I understand? Yeah, a long time now. Let me talk, should I talk through? Okay, yeah, I love talking it. about it. Um, and so, so here's one or two uh, beginning remarks. I think the problem with many people's devotional lives, if they even exist, is that people will start in to have some time with the Lord, reading scripture and so, and and they have a good thought and they're like, oh, that's good. Oh, that's good too. That's a good, th that's a good too. That's good. And you, you do that for 10 or 15 minutes and you've got seven or eight great thoughts. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, after the passing of, uh, you know, an hour or two into the day where somebody to ask one, um, you know, what did you feel like the Lord said to you in your devotional life? People would typically answer, tons of things. Well, tell me one. I can't remember one of them, but I just remember feeling very close to the Lord, like God's word was really speaking to me. Well, that's good, but I don't think that's great. What I like about this method is that it's going to push us to distill to one thought. So let me illustrate. If you're reading uh, the Gospel of John, for example, and you'll just take one g chapter like we were talking about today, so you start in and you're reading and you're not rushing. You're going to give it time to, to sort of percolate in your soul as you're reading. But you'll come upon something and, and say, huh, that's a, that's a good thought. And maybe I'll put a little check there in my Bible um, or a little underline. And I'll come to something else. That was, that's a good response. I need to have more responses like Jesus has. That was a good response. Um, you know, or maybe one or two others. Now, at this point, I'm not going to close it up and say, there, that was good. Mm -hmm. Now I'm going to push myself to choose one scripture, one of the verses of the 15, 18, 20, 25, or if you're doing a Bible through the year, you're reading several chapters a day, you're going to go for one verse. Okay. You're going to write the verse down or type it in, and that's your S. Gotcha. Then you'll go to the O, that's the observations. Now, if you have a study Bible, and a lot of times this is helpful, especially if you're just getting started, because you're like, I don't know, what was the context? And it's always important to know the context if I'm going to understand this. You know, okay, in this instance, um, Pharisees were trying to trap Jesus and sort of to get him to say the wrong thing and, and to trick him. And, okay, that's the context. So, you know, you, you, then you make an observation. Well, I noticed that Jesus answered the question with a question, that might be worth trying sometimes. You know, just, just make, you're just writing that. I noticed Jesus, I observe that Jesus answered the question with a question. Right. Maybe you make another observation or two. Then you move to the application. Okay, how can I apply that learning in my life today? 
well, as a matter of fact, I'm having a meeting this afternoon with these people and they want to know about this. And, you know, uh, if I get myself in this awkward situation, maybe I ought to make sure that I'm understanding what it is that they're driving at. Sometimes answering the question with a, you know, so look at that. What Jesus did, there has some relevance in my life. And, you know, maybe that'd be a better response than getting hot headed and, you know, in, in the meeting. And, um, and so you're writing down application and then you move to the P and that's the prayer where um, many times I'll start off by just saying, you know, Lord, thanks for the truth that you showed me here and, and how timely that is. I need to apply that. And then, you know, then I'll usually my prayer time because I'm, I'm a typer and I, it helps me to stay focused on what I'm praying for and not to get distracted if I just type my prayer. So I'll usually just go then. And a, a lot of times, sort of what Ben was talking about, just unfiltered, um, talking with the Lord and just saying, here's everything that's on my heart, everything that's mm -hmm. on my mind. Then, last thing, this is cool. Um, once you're done with it, give it a title. So, uh, you know, maybe title would be how to respond to an awkward con in an awkward conversation or responding in an awkward conversation. And just give it a title. Sort of like if anybody was ever reading your devotional journal like you read Oswald Chambers or, or other great saints of the faith, they would see here's what mm -hmm. the title, title. is. Right. Then in your journal, um, leave a few blank pages at the start that you can create an index. Hmm. And so you'll, you'll go and you'll make several columns. The first column is the date. Uh, January the 12th, 2015, the scripture is uh, this verse. The title is responding in an awkward situation or, you know, whatever the title is. The great thing about doing this is that as you grow and you have one page of index and you have two pages of index and three pages, you really begin to see, I'm hearing from the Lord. And it also is helpful sometimes, you know, maybe you're in a grow group and somebody gets sick or gets in a, an emergency and they can't come and they're like, could you share something or could you kind of help lead? One of the great things is you just pull out your devotional journal and say, you know what, let me share something that I felt like God was really showing me in not my devotional life four days ago. The scripture was this. And now you know the context, and here's some observations that I made, and I sort of saw in my study Bible this is kind of relevant. And, and, and here's how I've been trying to apply that in my life. And, and uh, you know, all of a sudden, you actually have something that you can say of spiritual value mm -hmm. that came from God's Word because you were drawing near to Him and spending that time with Him. So that's the way I love doing it, and it's not for everybody, and there's not one size fits all. Everybody has to figure out how they're going to connect uh, best, but that is the way that year in and year out, I found consistently I can just always get right back to working on my core and um, growing that soul um, when I'm practicing that. Really. And it doesn't require extra books or extra devotionals no. or anything like that. So you have everything that you, you everything need you right yeah, there. Exactly. Um, you mentioned that um, about things, you have to find what works for you. And sure. I know you talked a little bit about that in the message today, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. talking about Gary Thomas's um, uh, Sacred Pathways. Sacred Pathways. Sure. Um, we did include an assessment that you can take um, oh, with our Grow Group questions today. So if you want to download those after PostScript, um, you can take the quiz and see which way you lean more by answering those as well. So kind of which helpful. pathway Which fits pathway fits you, you. best. And yeah. there's a description of all of those available for you as well. So, all right, good. Yeah, good. All right. Well, um, we're going to continue on next week with the breathing room. Part two. All right. And so thank you for joining us today for PostScript. We'll see you back here next week. Thanks for joining us for PostScript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.